it off to Will Coleman for the tomahawk. Oh, oh, oh my! Will Coleman off the run. He dominated on the court. Now he brings his talent to the microphone. Welcome to the Will Coleman Show, a Bluff City Media audio podcast. Stepping up to the microphone is the big man himself, Will Coleman. Now, let's get to the show. There it is. There it is. Super, super. Man, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty pumped, man. I'm pretty, I'm pretty pumped about this. Um, got my, got my ace in the driver's seat, man. Yeah, yep. I'm just uh. I'm just a, you know, the the co-pilot. That's that's the wizard. That's the wizard over there, my man Kay. Um, but listen, so many great things, you know, that's that that's on my mind. So many amazing things I want to talk about. So many amazing things I want to discuss. But obviously, you know, we're gonna address the elephant in the room, and that's Tiger basketball. For all of my Tiger fans out there and every single person that loves every single player in a Tiger jersey. And my and my and my diehards, okay? My 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 true blues, you know, we got a lot of fair weather fans out there, but I'm I'm talking about I'm talking about those people that want to be in a forum on a on a Thursday night at 7 p.m. when we play the when we play the two lanes or when we play the SMUs. You know those, those those fans right there, man. Those fans right there, or or when we play the the Alabama States out of conference. You know those games that don't look that enticing on paper, or don't really pique your interest. We want to we want to reach out to those people that need to be in the seats, that need to be in the forum on those games. And that's something I'm excited to share. And this is a pro Memphis Tiger podcast. You know I'm not going. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I understand there's a difference between criticism and critiquing, but we're not finna be on here. You know, we're not about to be be on a on a podcast just dogging my guys. That's not that's not what it's about. But well, and you have an interesting you have an interesting perspective, Will, because you're a player, right? Like a right, former right, player right. who used to don that blue and gray, baby. Like you right, are right, on that right, floor, right? Sweating blood and tears, baby. Right, so. Right. I mean, you have a different perspective, right? And I think that's why it's so interesting that you're going to do a show with us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, 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 and just being in that environment and being in that element and being able to spread, you know, just as much positivity around the program and, and my guys as much as I can because there's the, they, they receive so much scrutiny, so much negativity, and, and just so many things that really could, could, could drive them down a hole – that they don't really need to be in. And I want to be able to, you know, lift these guys, motivate these guys. And I want this to be a safe haven and 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 this be a space where these guys come and look and they know, you know, Bluff City, Will Coleman, and all these guys are riding for us. And 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 we can lean on those guys whenever we need a positive bug. Now, Obviously, us, you know, rolling through the podcast, you know, obviously, we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll dabble in some other things, you know, Grizz, Memphis, Tennessee, and, you know, I got a couple other things, you know, that I, you know, up my sleeve, mini segments, if you will. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I want to dabble into, but riding the wave of my guys and making sure, you know, we, we, we spread as much positivity and we're giving all the exposure to these guys because they deserve it. They deserve it. And I want them to have everything that they deserve, and I want them to have everything that's coming their way. So, Will, can we do a little background? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of new Tiger fans. I mean, there's there's so many people, man. It's crazy. Like for those of you who are listening to this and watching this, it, it's crazy because you you go to the FedEx Forum with Will Coleman, and it's like it's like a different <laughs> level. I mean. People just, obviously, you're a former player, and people just, I mean, Tiger fans that have been around this program for so many years, they just, man, you're a, you're you're one of those players that is just adored here, like a former player that just Tiger fans have just taken hold of. You've you've obviously taken hold of the city. This is your home. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us, tell for the new Tiger fans, for those young ones, those young bucks, and and young ladies that might not know you know, kind of your history with the mm -hmm. University of Memphis. Kind of give us a little background on on your time here, when you came to Memphis, how you got here, and just kind of moving forward from that. So it 
it started, you know, obviously everybody. It's still a sore, sore subject. I, I mean, and I, and I get it. So I went to Miami Day Junior College. Went to Miami Day Junior College, and I was down there with the elite of the elite. I mean, I, we probably just, you know, and I, it's a bold statement, but I'm going to say the nation. Miami Day Junior College probably had the best front court in the nation at that time, even on the junior college level, because I was down there with Trevor Mbakwe. Mbakwe went to Minnesota, and for those of you that don't know Trevor, he was just an absolute animal. Okay, I mean, insane basketball player, extremely athletic, rebound the hell out the ball. Um, I was down there with him. I was down there with Darnell Dotson, uh, another guy. Named James Beatty, went to Rutgers. Another guy, um, uh, Sherrod Minus, went to, um, where'd he go? Somewhere in Carolina. Um, University of North Carolina, upstate, or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And we had a couple other players, you know, a couple other role players that were just bananas. But, but when we were down there, I mean, Coach Cal was at all our necks. He flew down to Miami himself. He sat down and had a conversation with me, sat down and had a conversation with Trevor, and sat down and had a conversation with Darnell Dotson. Um, you know, with that being said, you know, everything that panned out, all of us were slated to come to Memphis. Cal got everybody to commit. Darnell, you know, signed with us. Trevor signed with us. I signed with uh, Memphis. But obviously – you know, Cal up and decides he, you know, sayonara. <laughs> he went to Kentucky. And I don't blame him because it's like as a as a collegiate coach and being able to coach in the Rupp Arena, I mean, you can't argue with that. It's the Mecca, man. Yeah, yeah. You you can't you can't you you can't you you can't debate that. And it's like now the way he did it was probably pretty crappy. You know, everybody's upset about that. He he it was a little classless. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Like, uh, I mean, yeah. Like, I just you look at what uh, as I've gotten some like kind of space from that time period right. and grown in maturity and right. wisdom in my old age. Right. What I've learned is, especially guys like John Calipari, don't take their words for granted. Right. Like, right. 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 You know, they they're gonna say things to sell sell you know certain things. It was the way that he went about with the the recruiting class. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean. I, I mean it was it was it was crazy. You know, he did what he did and you know he, he went where he went. But it was so it was so wild because it just like it, it came out of nowhere. Like it came out of nowhere. And Cal, if it didn't have an M on it, Cal took it. Like straight up. If it didn't have an M on it, Cal took it and went to Kentucky. Now, with that being said, you know, everything that fell out the way the NCAA was rolling back then, you know, I had signed to play for Cal at the time. So I was able to opt out of my LOI and go to Kentucky if that's what I chose to do. But instead, you know, I, I had long conversations with a very, very close friend of mine. He was almost like a mentor. Whatever you want to call it, brother, father, I mean, whatever, a guy named Matt Dunn. And, you know, he started talking to me about the pros and cons. You know, Will – if you go to Kentucky, you're junior, you got two years left. You're going to be fighting for time with, I mean, I think at that time, Patrick Patterson was the SEC player of the year. You had Daniel Orton coming in as a McDonald's All-American. You had DeMarcus Cousins coming in as a freshman, as a McDonald's All-American. And so here I'm a junior with only two years left, and so I'm fighting with an SEC player of the year, two freshmen that are McDonald's All-Americans. I just didn't see enough time for me. So I decided to stay at Memphis. And that decision was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made, you know, in my life. You got to tell us about your your talks with Josh, right? Josh had just gotten the job, his first ever head coaching, collegiate head coaching experience. <laughs> You got to tell us about those kind of initial conversations with Josh as he's trying to keep you in that class. Josh, Josh was the I still love Josh. Josh, my guy, man. I, I, I still get excited or giddy when I think about my guy, man, just because 
who he is as a person, you know, and I understand his time was running thin at the University of Memphis because of, you know, obviously people want to win. And Josh, the culture here just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't very Josh Pastner, you know, and I, I, I get it. I, you know, I respect it, but I mean, let's keep it a buck. You know, Memphis has a history of, you know, the class or the people that come in or that, you know, the, 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 the athletes that we recruit and Josh just didn't fit that bill in terms of the, the culture. Now, Josh, don't get me wrong. Josh recruit his ass off. Josh came to Georgia and sat in my kitchen and my mom cooked for him. Listen, I swear to you, I ain't never tasted no fried chicken like like that. My, <laughs> it was my mom made that chicken, fried that chicken, fried the hell out that chicken. And I've <laughs> never ever tasted chicken that good and she asked josh she asked josh when she talked what do, i'm a cook i'm a i want you to come talk to my son come please come josh i want fried chicken you know i'm in the south i want fried chicken my mom fried that chicken like it was her last meal dog and he just now i will say josh anybody that know josh josh know you know they know josh can be a little awkward when it comes to normal conversation he'll talk hoops all day but if you ask him what he did last night he gonna look at you like a deer caught in headlights. Was he good? Was he good with the parents? Like, oh yeah, like yeah, with, oh yeah. With your folks, was he good? Oh like, yeah, oh yeah. Let's not get it twisted, man. Josh was a hell of a coach. Oh right? yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I love sixty-seven yeah. and seventy-three in seven years here at Memphis. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know he. But I think a lot of people forget that. Right. A lot of people forget that. Right. But obviously, there's a love. There's a culture that comes with the University of Memphis, with the city of Memphis as a whole. Was. You, you mentioned a little bit ago that Josh didn't necessarily match that energy, that culture, I guess, possibly. Right, right, right. What was he like in that room with mom, with dad, with, with the folks that are around you? Like, what was he like going into a young black man's room, like house and he, talking to them? Like, what was he like? He was in, he was in straight, you know, sale mode, if that makes sense. Because he's trying to, you know, he's selling himself because it's his first year. But he's also trying to sell me on why Memphis is great. And for me at the time, the type of person that Josh was outweighed, you know, the basketball. And it probably should have been about the basketball. But, like, for me, a couple things that Josh said that stuck out to me and even stuck out to my mom, like, for me at the time, Josh Josh will tell you straight up, like, yes, he loved basketball. Yes, he want to win. Yes, he care about his programs. But his admiration and, and his fire for kids after they leave his program, that's what's important to Josh. I want you to get your degree. I want you to be set up for life after basketball. I want you to play for as long as you can, but I want you to be okay when the ball stops bouncing. And Josh promised he would take care of me and look out for me and all the things while he was at this school, and he did just that. So Josh will forever – ever have a spot you know with me in my pocket in my heart even to this day I still can call Josh he will answer if he don't answer he'll he'll call me back but I've always got a spot at his house at a basketball game so Josh it was it was way way bigger than basketball for me when it came to Josh what was it like like what did you learn about Memphis during your time here I mean, you obviously were – I mean, you put on the blue and gray, so Memphis Memphis adopted you as one of their own. What did you learn about Memphis while you were here as a player? Man, um, the biggest takeaway is the, – or the biggest thing was if you, if you take care of the city, the city will take care of you back. And so I spent more time trying to read at elementary schools and hang out with the, with the public – you know, rather than just sitting in my dorm. And we all did, me, Wesley Witherspoon. Um, we had a couple walk-ons, Malik, um, um, uh, Drew Baum at the time, DJ Steffens. I mean, we were we were super tight, and we spent a lot of time just hanging out, out and about. Um, I mean, everybody was out. I mean, Willie Kemp, Donnell Mack, Robert Sally, we was all super tight. And we did a lot more than a lot of people thought we would do that, that first season because, like I said, Kyle left and he took everything. 
And everybody thought we were just going to go, you know, just down the drain. But we ended up making it to the second round of the NIT with a broken roster that nobody thought we'd even get out of conference. So I think we – I think Josh did a pretty damn good job with what he had left when he came in his first year. So – I don't, and you know, there are a lot of people still so hard on Josh, and I don't understand why, but I think he overachieved while he was here. But that's, I mean, that's just my take. I don't, I don't know, you know, if anybody else feels different, please, by all means, let me know. I'd love to hear it. But from the number, you know, your God, he said it best, you know, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. And you said what, he was 160. Three and some change, 70, what, 70? 167 and 73. I mean, that's pretty doggone good. Seven years at a program. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't think that's anything to, you know, to just roll over or, or just skim over because that's pretty hard to do, especially with the traffic that he had coming in and the, and the talent that he had. I think he did pretty good. But – I came, I was the only Tiger that stayed. Um, everybody else left and went to Kentucky. I was the only, I was the only Tiger that stayed. And so, and 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 Wesley Witherspoon was a huge reason I stayed too because we talked hand in hand and we talked a lot. Wesley Witherspoon was the sole reason or one of them, you know, one of the reasons I decided to come to Memphis because we talked a lot before I got here. We spoke a lot. And, you know, we got on the phone. We had a conversation. Wesley was, you know, was going to Kentucky, Wesley let me know, man, look, I'll stay here if you stay here. And so I was like, okay, cool. I like this West guy. Um, super tight, both from Georgia. So that's that's it. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stay at Memphis. And the rest was history. Yeah, you've been here ever since. Been there ever since. Met some wonderful people. Had a beautiful baby girl with an amazing person. Um. I mean, there's so many things that I can get into when it comes to all of that, but I just, it's so many blessings from that. But, you know, my daughter's 100% the reason I decided to stay here. She keeps me on my toes. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and, and pleased with the way the community treats me and my, my daughter. Yeah, man. So like you, you've got a, she's 11, right? Oh yeah. Look 17, but. Look 17. That's all right. I saw some videos last week of y'all at a, daddy daughter dance yeah yeah tell yeah. me about this man tell me about this daddy daughter dance so it, it was uh, you know first and foremost i'm a, i don't again i don't care if my i don't care if my kids 15 55 65 if i'm here and she hit me and say she want to go to a daddy daughter dance or just want to go dancing period i'm in there i'm in there you know she invited me and she spent majority of the time running around with her friends. So collectively a lot of dads tend to just hang out. Which is totally fine, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Do your thing. Be social. Go hang with your friends. I'm I'm just glad you invited me. I'm just glad you invited me. So coming here, I mean you've you've you you came from Georgia to Memphis. Right. And now you're, you know, twelve years later, eleven years later, you're still here. Mm-hmm. You've you've got wisdom and age around you now, mm -hmm. a lot of time. What are some of the things that you've learned about yourself over these last? Like people see you on the court, they see you playing, they know your history, they know what you've done. But what would you say is like, hey man, this is what I've learned. This is what I know about myself being a father, being an involved dad. What do you what do you know about yourself now, man? I'd probably say, I'd probably say, and it's not perfect, but I'd have to say communicating is probably one of the most important things that I have to continuously work on because when you can communicate effectively with people, um, it, it changes a lot. Um, and that, and I've learned that from my daughter because my daughter will talk to me and will let me know things and will express things. If I don't know how to reciprocate or talk with her or have a conversation with her, then we're in trouble. Um, and even, and, and I apply that to everyday life, even with, you know, my ex teammates, you know, if I can have a conversation with them or if I can talk to them at any point in time or any given time, um, then I will. But I, I'd say just 
being able to have clear communication. Now, I'm still not the best at it, but I'm trying. But I'd say having clear communication with people in general is something that I've learned over time. And I think it's been a great skill to acquire. So you, since you've been in the city for this amount of time, what do you think are, let's get back to basketball for a second. Like where, where's, what's the state of the program right now as you see it? Um, right now, I, I, the reason I love this team so much is because, you know, you got a group of guys that like each other and that want to work hard. And now, you know, you don't have a roster full of five-star athletes, but you got a group of guys who will literally ride for each other at any point in time. And for me, I'm willing to take that over a roster full of five stars any day because I know you're going to get 110 out of these guys and they're always going to be there for one another. That's just my take. That's just my opinion. You know, you get all 10, 15 of those guys and you ask them to run through a brick wall with this particular team we have now, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. Whereas, you you know, you may have a couple five-star athletes who are too big for the program or they're too big to do whatever the coach asks or they're too big to do whatever they need to with their team or whatever the case may be. But I think we're building a, a great, solid foundation for this program at this current moment. How excited were you? Like, what were your thoughts when – Penny Hardaway took over the team. I I mean it was, you know, it was it was it was so many things that ran through my mind because you know you know even I mean there's a lot of people that have played and tried to get into coaching and it didn't work. You know, I think hell. I mean, I think Larry Bird was one of the first ones to say it like, man, look, I I look, I got the bread. I'll buy the team, but coaching ain't my thing. You know, I I just I can't coach. I don't want to coach, so I'll lead us to somebody else. But I think Penny is coming around, even though he's been with the program for, I think, five years, six years. People don't understand. You still you you still need time. There are so many things that Penny still can and will learn to, to, to put into this program. But I think for the most part, I think Penny's doing a solid job with the with the amount of time that he's been here. Um you know, obviously people get frustrated and they see things as far as, you know, rotation or, you know, subbing schemes or game plans and stuff like that. But people got to understand, man, it takes patience. It takes patience. And you got to have it. When someone's rebuilding a program, you need a minimum of five years to even get in the right, to, to, to just go in the right trajectory. So, I think this year, you know, Penny's kind of got a culture around the program where he kind of, you know, guys kind of know what Penny is expecting or he wants. So I think Penny's doing a damn good job at the rate he's going and what he was handed. Because, you know, if I'm keeping it real, Tubby kind of left the program, you know, kind of, you know, wasn't really involved, didn't want to be in the city much. I mean, he was a recluse. And so that kind of hurt the program a little bit, but I think Penny's doing a good job, man. Absolutely, yeah. I think I think we were talking about it before we got on the radio or got li- went live. It, there's definitely a different vibe and feel around the around the city in regards to the Memphis Tigers this year. Did you expect them come into this year? Right now, we're film we're recording this on Friday, uh, the day before a home game against Tulane. Uh, did you expect them to be seventeen and five at this point in the season? No, if I'm not, no, not at all, not at all. Um, I, I, I did. I just being honest, I didn't because there were so many things. You know, like I said, I mean, it, it seemed like Penny was, you know, trying to figure out, you know, like I said, game plan, schemes, subbing, rotations. There are so many things because he, at a high school roster, college roster, maybe even NBA, you're going to have a solid eight guys like a core of guys that you just roll with and you know those other guys are kind of going to be role players or fill in but it it, it definitely seems like Penny has some guys that are his go-to guys that he wants to keep on the floor and it's starting to show and you know at first nobody knew what 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 really to expect but 
KD and Dre have literally told everyone and showed everyone this is our team. We're going to lead you guys, and we're going to make things happen. And and I think that's something that all Tiger fans love to see. Because in the past, we've lacked leadership or just like vocal leadership, I feel like. No one has – well, I'm not going to say we've lacked it, but I'm just saying as far as having a leader that the whole team just respected, I think Dre and KD has gotten that respect and people don't mind listening to them and, and the teammates don't mind following them because they, they produce on and off the court. So I, I think that helps a lot. Yeah, I think the production on the court is one thing, right? Like, you know, being a being a leader on the team, like I think you look at a guy like Alex Lomax. Yeah. You know, from the city. Um, one of the things that I can tell about Alex is that no matter who it is who comes into this program, he's kind of the gatekeeper for the program, right? Oh, yeah. Like he oh, comes yeah. in and people are like, we need to make sure, like Alex is that dude. He's that leader mm-hmm. on the team. Um, there's a level of production that comes with, you know, on the floor, there's a lot of things, and we've talked about this numerous times, you can't just judge a player, his success or his failure off of a stat sheet, right? Right, right, like, right, right. And, and so people look at Alex and they say, well, he's not scoring double-digit points a game. He's, you know, doing this, that, and the third. But it, it's the it's the, the more nuanced, like, watching of the game where right. you see his imprint all right. over it. But right. then you got a guy like Kendrick who comes in who right. is producing at a very, very, very high level. Oh, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you this. We had a conversation with Kendrick and with Penny a few weeks ago. It was after the Cincinnati game. Right, right. And everybody knew coming into that Cincinnati game that Cincinnati was the number one three-point shooting team in the AAC. Mm-hmm. Shot 36%, I think, from the you know as a team from the right. three-point line. And it was right. pretty clear very early on that Penny said the game plan for this game is going to be getting the ball out of the guards' hands and away from where they want to be, where they want to shoot the ball at, where they can get hot and really kind of you know right. pull away. And so they they focused a lot of their energy towards getting the ball funneled down low to uh Lockin, the the big seven yeah. footer. Yeah, and he 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 went crazy now. I ain't gonna, he he kind of went ham. He went crazy, but I think Penny was okay with that, right? Yeah, yeah, you you can live with that. You can live with that. And what you, was what was interesting to me is is that one of the things you saw Penny do is you know, they would set screens, you know, to get the Victor would set a screen. Um, the guard would get the ball and they would, the Tigers would switch every time. And, yeah. and a lot of times Kendrick was kind of caught up in that screen mm-hmm. and would be matched up in the post against Victor Locken. Right. Kendrick right. is, Kendrick is small. Yeah. Victor yeah. is not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I asked Kendrick about this. I said, you know, when you see a game plan like that, it's very clear that was the game plan was to get the ball into his hands, to get that mismatch to where it was Victor that had to get the ball. There was mm-hmm. the clear mismatch on for him. Right. Get the ball out of the three point shooter hands down to Victor Locken. Mm-hmm. And I asked Kendrick, I said, you know, as the leader of the t- on the team, as the the guy, the 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 main guy, hearing that you have to you're gonna be in the paint, banging down low with a seven footer. Right. How difficult was it to like keep that game plan going to say, man, he's scoring on me a lot. But, hey, we're following the game plan from what the coach has said. And right, his, right. his response was, if you believe in the coaches, you can do it. And and that, to me, is really big. And I wanted to ask you about that as a former player. Like, what – when you see a guy like Kendrick saying, I'm willing to take that L in that game and get beat up in the post like I did yeah, to fulfill the game plan, which ultimately ended in a win for the Tigers, that says a lot to the rest of the team, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you, you – when you – if you got your lead – your leader, <clears throat> excuse me, if you got the leader of your team openly stating and speaking, confidently speaking, he's bought into the scheme, he's bought into the program, if you're not okay with that, then then something's wrong. Because if you have the most productive player on your team chatting about buying in and trusting the coaches, and then you have somebody else who's not okay with that, then they got to go. You know what I mean? That's a cancer to your team. But I think that's huge, you know, for a lot of people to hear that and for him to openly say that. I think he's 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 letting people know that he trusts his coach. He trusts Penny, and he's going to buy in and do what he has to do 
to sacrifice his body. I mean, him and Lomax, I mean, all of those guys sacrificing their body to do what they got to do to get this win or get a win for this team and this program. I, I mean, you know, we could talk about that stuff all day, but I just I, I think that says a lot when your leader speaks up and, and does something like that. Uh, it just, you know, I don't know. Like I said, I, it's, I'm, I'm a broken record, but you 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 could you could literally you know talk about that all day. It just it boosts your program, let you know what kind of guys you got in your program, and I think it's good for people to see that. So, man, I'm excited about this show, man. Yeah, I yeah. think it's going to be dope. Well, what can we? What what can Bluff City Media fans, Tiger fans, what can they expect from you? We're we're going to be talking to some different people, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're going to have guests, you know, funneling in, you know, throughout the show. I mean, you know, guys that I play with, guys that, you know, were in the program, guys that I've met in the city that I play with that are big Tiger fans. I mean, even I got some ladies out there who are diehard Memphis fans and just sports advocates that I want to get in here. I mean, there's so many different things that I want to bring to this show. You know, different people, different guests, different different scenarios, so many things. And and, and I think it's going to be action-packed, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Man. I just want to thank everybody for coming out, checking out the Will Coleman podcast. So many gems coming through, so much action coming through. Y'all stay tuned, stay committed, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Will Coleman Show. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and a comment wherever you download your podcasts. Head over to www.bluffcitymedia.co where you will find comprehensive coverage of Tiger Athletics and how you can become a contributor.